We meet today to consider three pending nominations for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. With three nominees are Judy Chang, David Rosner, and Ms. Lindsay C. We welcome all three nominees and thank each of them for being here this morning and for their willingness to serve on the commission. We also welcome their family members who are able to join us this morning, and I, and I encourage you to introduce them and your, when your uh, time comes to give your opening remarks. The work of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC as we know it, is enormously important for our country. The commission's job is to ensure the orderly development of plentiful supplies of electricity, natural gas at reasonable prices. It enables us to keep the lights on, protects the American people from excessive gas and electric rates, and it protects the public interest. The job calls for people who can fairly assess the needs and concerns of all interests affected by our energy policies and apply the law. Today, we're here to assess the experience and qualifications of three nominees before us for this important job. First, we have Ms. Judy Chang. Ms. Chang has more than 20 years of experience working with energy companies, trade associations, and governments on energy regulatory and financial issues. She previously served as the Undersecretary of Energy and Climate Solutions under Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker, friend of mine and a Republican, and helped develop Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan. She has been nominated for the uh, term beginning on July of 2024. Next, we have David Rosner. David has been employed by the Commission as an energy industry analyst for the, last, uh, for the past seven years. He has been on detail to, to the Democratic staff of this committee for the past, past two years, where he has worked with both sides on electricity issues. Prior to that, he worked at the Department of Energy and at the Bipartisan Policy Center with almost 20 years total in these various capacities. He has been nominated to fill the remainder of the term that began on July of 2022. Our third and final nominee is Lindsay C. Lindsay is currently a West Virginia Solicitor General, a post she has held for the past six years. In that role, she has represented my state's legal interest in both state and federal courts, including the United States Supreme Court. Prior to that, she practiced appellate and administrative law at a firm in Washington, D.C. after graduating from Harvard Law School. She's been nominated to fill the remainder of the term that began in Ju July of 2023. The President has done his job in sending us three nominations to fully staff the Commission. Now it's up to us to weigh their qualifications for confirmation. I congratulate all three of you uh, and, uh, and thank you for your willingness to serve our country in this important role. Uh, at this point, I'm going to recognize Senator Barrasso for his opening statement. Well, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding today's hearing. And we're going to consider the three nominees, as you mentioned, to serve on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, Ms. Lindsay C., and did you say from West Virginia? West Virginia. Okay, we want to make sure. David Rosner as well, and Judy Chang. And welcome all. that happened. I, I welcome all of you to the committee. Uh, Ms. C. is an outstanding appellate lawyer. Uh, has been spent the last seven years as Solicitor General of the Chairman's home state of West Virginia, and during that time, she has overseen civil and criminal appeals in both the state and the federal courts. Ms. C. has fought tirelessly for affordable and reliable energy for all American families. She's argued cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. In one of those cases, she not only advocated on behalf of West Virginia, also advocated on behalf of my home state of Wyoming, and she won. Uh, from a young age, she has distinguished herself as a person of exemplary discipline, drive, and determination. Graduated summa cum laude from Patrick Henry College, then graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, where she served as executive editor of the Harvard Law Review. Quite impressive. After law school, clerk for Judge Thomas Griffin of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and if confirmed, uh, Ms. C. will bring her impressive experience uh, working with complex statutes to the commission. Ms. C. is well positioned to ensure that the commission faithfully adheres to its statutory mandate. Mr. Rosner is a familiar face, knows the, FER, knows the FERC's responsibilities firsthand. Since 2017, he's worked as an energy industry analyst at the Commission, and over the last two years, he's served as Commission's detailee to the majority staff here. Uh, during that time, Mr. Rosner has, has represented Chairman Manchin and worked constructively with my staff as well. If confirmed, he will no longer represent anyone but himself, and for that reason, I look forward to learning more today about his personal views on the very specific issues. Ms. Chang is a self-described advocate of what she calls, quote, clean energy transition, close quote. Between 2020 and 2023, she developed energy and climate policies for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. 
uh, remind the committee, this is the state that consumes twice as much electricity as it produces. It's a state that benefits from the resolve of other states and other countries uh, to produce the energy that Massachusetts needs and uses. And it's a state where residents pay among the highest electricity and natural gas prices in the nation. In 2023, households in Massachusetts paid 84 percent more than the national average for a kilowatt hour of electricity. They paid 40 percent more than the national average for a cubic foot of natural gas. Massachusetts has the third highest prices in the nation for both electricity and national gas, and consumers feel the high prices. On the basis of her previous statements, I'm concerned that she has paid far too little attention to these facts. In 2016, she said that the current low price of natural gas, she said, sends the wrong signal to achieve the objectives of Massachusetts policy. The policy was referring to was the state's radical climate agenda. In 2018, Ms. Chang said, as she asked, does it make sense to build more gas pipelines and gas or gas plants? She responded just by saying, to me, it doesn't make sense. Well, natural gas is critical for the reliability of electric service in this country. New England faces this reality each and every winter. The efforts of Massachusetts to block natural gas pipelines not only means higher prices for its residents, it means that Massachusetts has had to import liquefied natural gas from overseas including in the past LNG from Russia, just to keep homes warm and the lights on. Under the law, FERC is responsible for ensuring the development of abundant supplies of natural gas at reasonable prices. Ms. Cheng, in the past, has advocated for the direct opposite. And for that reason, I think the burden is on the nominee to explain why we should support her nomination. The last thing that FERC needs is someone eager to impose the failed policies of Massachusetts upon the rest of our nation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And uh, if, um, if the three of you will stand now and we have the rules of the committee apply that nominees require that they be sworn in connection with their testimony, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give to the Senate Committee in Energy and Natural Resources shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. Uh, before we begin our statements and you begin yours, I'll ask three questions addressed to each nominee before this committee. Will you be available to appear before the committee and other congressional committees to represent uh, departmental positions and respond to issues of concern to the Congress? Yes. Yes. Are you aware of any potential holdings, investments, or interests that could const constitute a conflict of interest or create the appearance of such a conflict should you be confirmed and assume the office to which you've been nominated by the president? No. No. I will take um, the appropriate actions to, uh, based on the recommendations of the um, ethics counselor uh, upon uh, 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 appropriate, um, to, ab to avoid any conflict of interest, sir. Thank you. Are you involved or do you have any assets held in a blind trust? No. 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 Thank you. Before we get to statements, let me ask each of the nominees to, to introduce any members of your family or friends who are with you this morning. And I'll begin with you, Ms. Chang. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with me are my husband, James McNeil, and Tara McNeil, and I'm very grateful for them to be here. Great. Mr. Osner. Thank you, sir. My, I'm joined by my wife, Jasmine, who's sitting behind me. Great to have you all here. Ms. C. Thank you, Chairman. I'm joined by my parents, Robert and Kathleen C., uh, my siblings who are here, including my three-month-old niece, Eliza, who took her first flight ever to be here, as well as a number of I think we just heard her. We did. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, all of you. You all should be extremely proud to be nominated and uh, be asked to serve at a high level. So with that, we're going to uh, statements. We, we're going to begin with uh, our statements by each one of our uh, nominees. And Ms. Chang, we'll start with you. Thank you, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and distinguished members of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. I'm honored to be here today as a nominee to serve as a commissioner on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I would like to thank President Biden for nominating me, and I thank Chairman Manchin and Ranking Member Barrasso for holding this hearing. I'm grateful to appear today with my fellow nominees Mr. Rosner and Ms. C, whom I've had the great pleasure to know a bit over the last few weeks, and I hope we get an opportunity to work collaboratively together in the future. 
I also want to thank my husband, who has been supporting me for many, many years, and my daughter, Tara, who is here today. My other daughter will be joining virtually. My approach to energy policy and energy issues is shaped by personal background. I spent my formative years in Taiwan and the Philippines before moving to California to finish high school and attend university. Having grown up in developing countries, I have experienced firsthand power outages and um, as a da daily event. Candlelit dinners were not just for the romantics, they were necessary to see what you're eating. From a very young age, my parents instilled in me the principle of no resource shall ever be wasted, working hard to save every penny. To this day, I'm always turning the lights off behind my children and they, as they leave the room and urging them to wear a sweater through the late fall in New England before finally turning on the heat. I earned my undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from University of California, Davis. From early on, I wanted to work on improving infrastructure around the world, particularly understanding and experience what a lack of infrastructure meant for people's daily lives. After obtaining my master's degree in, ma in public policy, I started working in finance and economic consulting in the energy sector. Much of that work has been technical in nature, applying my background in engineering and economics to analyze issues within the energy sector, including wholesale electricity market design and infrastructure planning and development. In that capacity, I had advised a broad spectrum of energy companies, including various investor-owned utilities, public power, cooperative utilities, and independent power producers. That experience allowed me to work on diverse energy issues across the US, covering many states, and gave me the appreciation of the significant regional differences in how people produce and consume energy in this country. In 2020, I had the distinct privilege to join the then Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker's administration. In that role, I learned a tremendous amount working with my colleagues and stakeholders across the region. I led the six New England states in developing a consensus vision for long-term power system planning. That included working with the New England independent system operator to initiate a forward-looking and long-term transmission planning process to promote the reliability and resilience of the electricity grid at a cost customers can, can afford. With my experience in private sector and state government, I have a deep appreciation for the foundational importance of ensuring the reliability and the affordability of energy systems. These imperatives are front and center in every utility executive and government leader's mind. And they are prerequisites for a robust economy and the continuation of the energy transition in which the country finds itself today. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is an independent regulatory agency that plays a crucial role in ensuring both reliability and affordability. Its broad jurisdiction includes the regulation of rates for wholesale sales and transmission of electricity and the interstate transmission of natural gas as well as siting authority for things like interstate natural gas pipelines, liquefied natural gas export facilities, and hydroelectric facilities. Should I have the privilege of being confirmed, I commit to keeping both reliability and affordability at the forefront of my mind as I rigorously and independently examine the particular facts and circumstances in every proceeding that comes before the commission. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Thank you, Ms. Shane. Mr. Rosner, please. Chairman Manchin, <clears throat> Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning as a nominee to serve on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I am humbled to be considered for this opportunity to serve my country. I would like to thank President Biden for nominating me and for his confidence in my ability to serve as a commissioner. I want to thank Chairman Manchin for the opportunity to contribute to the work of this committee as a detailee over the last 18 months. And I especially want to thank my wife, Jasmine, for her steadfast support for my career in public service, and to our children, Olive and Quinn, for motivating me to pursue the greater good for our country. For the past 17 years, I have enjoyed working on energy policy, both from within and outside the federal government, 
which has given me the opportunity to develop relevant expertise across economic, technological, and regulatory domains. Throughout my career, I have worked across ideological lines to build consensus on difficult energy issues. First, as a member of the staff that launched the Bipartisan, Sen Bipartisan Policy Center, then by supporting Secretary Moniz and his team at the U.S. Department of Energy, as staff with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commis Commission, supporting chairs from both political parties, and most recently during my time as a staff member detailed from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to this committee. Through these experiences, I have learned firsthand the importance of listening to all stakeholders, and I am convinced that effective engagement serves to broaden the support that is so critical to reasoned decision-making and to strengthening the Commission's orders by ensuring that all views are considered. I have also had the great privilege of working for the chairs and commissioners of FERC and alongside its talented, world-class staff. This allows me to speak from experience when I say that it would be an honor to be confirmed as a FERC commissioner. Having served alongside FERC staff, I can vouch for the fact that FERC is an expert body that lives up to Congress's vision for an independent, bipartisan regulator of our increasingly complex energy system. FERC's leaders and civil servants work tirelessly to guide the Commission's decisions towards sound, legally durable outcomes that hold true to the agency's statutory authority and make our country and our allies more energy secure. The Commission's core responsibility, its job number one, is to ensure the reliable operation of the country's electric grid. None of our country's economic or policy priorities can be achieved if energy reliability is not preserved. Consumers demand it, they deserve it, and it is FERC's most sacred duty to ensure it. If honored to be confirmed, I will remain grounded in this mission to ensure reliability. This means respecting the reality of the resources that power our economy today and keeping an eye on the horizon to ensure that the next generation of technologies, which Congress has unlocked through the important bipartisan legislation that originated from this committee, can play their role to bring reliable, safe, secure, and affordable energy to all Americans. If confirmed, I commit above all to abide by the laws passed by Congress and judicial president, precedent to act fairly and to consider the views put forth by all parties when deciding matters before FERC. Whether that be applications for natural gas pipeline or hydropower projects, tariff proceedings for electric markets or transmission planning, oil pipeline rates, or other issues before the Commission. It is through that case-by-case -case and issue-by-issue -issue approach that FERC achieves its mission as an independent regulator and delivers the best outcomes for our country. Thank you once again for the opportunity to appear before you today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, sir. And now, Ms. C. Thank you, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and each member of the committee for your time today and for your work on the important issues of energy security facing our country. It's an honor to appear before you as a nominee to serve on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Thank you also to President Biden for nominating me to this position and to Leader McConnell for his recommendation that he should. I'm humbled by their trust in my ability to serve the American people in this way. I'd also like to acknowledge West Virginia Attorney General Patrick Morrissey and my colleagues in the AG's office. Representing my adopted state has been a true honor these past six plus years, and I count it a privilege to serve the Mountain State alongside such a professional and committed group of colleagues and friends. And I'm deeply grateful to my family. My siblings, Jason, Jamison, Whitney, and Ashley are here today. Thank you to them and to the rest of their families supporting for Michigan. Thanks also to Rachel and Josh Baer for their close friendship and always open guest room, and to my goddaughter, Maria. In full candor to the committee, at 10 years old, she was less than impressed to learn that I had been nominated to a commission that she had never heard of, but she got considerably more invested in the idea and we told her that she could skip school to be here today for a real live civics lesson instead. And of course, thank you to my parents, Robert and Kathleen C. I treasure your support and keep your examples of a life well lived in front of me each day. FERC's crucial work is at the intersection of what drives me in my career. As an administrative and appellate lawyer, I've spent much of the last dozen years deep in complex statutes and detailed and technical records. The energy space gives this ad admittedly nerdy species of the law real consequences for real people. 
I remember, for instance, what it was like being part of the 50 million people in the 2003 blackout across northeastern America and southern Canada. I recall the anxiety, realizing just how widespread the problem was and just how little control we had over it. And it was more than just the inconvenience when homes, stores, and streetlights suddenly went dark. A family member was nine months pregnant at the time, and the days it took for the lights to come back on sparked growing worry about her safety and access to medical care. Now, fortunately, all ended well there, and I've had quite a few where does the time go moments over the past few weeks, realizing her son is now 20. But Congress responded to that blackout by adding Section 215 to the Federal Power Act, giving FERC new responsibility to ensure grid reliability. I left it with a lasting reminder how critically and practically energy policy affects each one of us. My time as West Virginia Solicitor General has brought that lesson into laser focus again these past several years. Thanks to West Virginia's economic and power generation interests, energy matters have been front and center on my docket since day one on the job. Through dozens of cases and rulemakings, I've learned much more than I understood in 2003 that grid reliability, regulatory certainty, and affordable energy are essentials. I've also come to value the state's important role when it comes to generation and local distribution and understand the complexities that their different resources, geographies, and priorities can bring to the equation. My role as a state lawyer also solidified my respect for the interplay between state and federal regulators. I take the rule of law and separation of power seriously. I'm committed to the simple notion that agencies have only the power that you, Congress, give to them. And if I were honored to be confirmed, I would guard my duty as a commissioner to do no more than what Congress delegated to FERC in the U.S. Code, to stay in FERC's important but narrow lanes, applying that law faithfully and impartially based on the record before me. But I'm also committed to doing no less than what Congress has tasked to FERC. Understanding jurisdiction's limits can mean focusing more closely on what matters most. So to the best of my ability, I would work to continue the Commission's vital work in ensuring energy reliability, timely infrastructure review, and just and reasonable rates flowing from a fair interstate electricity market. And here again, I would draw on lessons from my current position working with stakeholders in West Virginia and around the country on various sides of sensitive and critically important issues. I would hope to add my experience to those of my fellow commissioners. I would look forward to working with them and the expert and dedicated FERC staff to do our part to fulfill FERC's mission as a nonpartisan and independent agency. I truly appreciate the honor to be considered for this role to serve the people across our nation whose daily lives depend on sound and predictable energy policy. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today, and I welcome your questions. Let me thank all of you for your introductions, and now we're going to begin our questioning, and I'll start. If you can, uh, we, we all have about five minutes here. If you can keep them as, uh, as concise as possible, we'll get through uh, a lot more that way. So I'll first ask you, um, can you describe each one of you, your view of FERC's most important responsibilities as you understand them? We'll start, Ms. Chang, with you. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, the first and foremost is reliability and affordability. And that uh, I, if I were uh, lucky enough to be confirmed, that would be at the forefront of my decision-making process and, um, and following the law and examining every case that comes before us. And understanding the difference between dispatchable and intermittent power, right? What's dispatchable and intermittent? Absolutely. The, uh, dispatchable is 24-7, something you can count on. It runs 24-7. Intermittent is basically it is when it is. Absolutely. To ensure the reliability of our grid, we need a mix of many resources, and each resource has its own place in ensuring reliable service for our nation. Thank you. Mr. Raza? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I, first and foremost, the Commission's job number one is reliability. Uh, the American people need it, they expect it, they deserve it. And uh, this, this is part of FERC's mission that touches every aspect of our economy and of American life. So if honored to be confirmed, that would be my priority number one. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Ms. C? The advantage or disadvantage of going third is I think will be a broken record. That's okay. Re reliability is certainly job number one for the commission. I think that's critically important, particularly in this time where we see our we're seeing changes in demand and load on these, and we're seeing changes in stressors on the sources we have. Let me follow up with that, saying, would you all consider yourself, if someone is, is describing each of you, would you say you're uh, an all-of-the-above energy person looking at everything that gives us the reliability, and as technology moves forward and one transition happens to another, as long as reliability is the main factor? 
I think absolutely uh, reliability is absolutely essential, and I think it requires looking at all of the different options that we have. You're open to all, all energy. Uh, certainly. I, I take seriously the concerns about our dispatchable resources and keeping um, open access to new entrants. Mr. Rosner. Uh, I, I identify strongly with the with the all of the above philosophy. I think what we've seen in the past uh, decade is that there is strength in a diverse resource mix. Uh, I also uh, appreciate all of the change, both on the demand and generation side of the mix, and would look to ensure that, uh, if honored to be confirmed, that we have a system that maintains reliability as that transition happens. I agree with Mr. Rosner and Ms. C on both of those accounts. Since molecules and, and, and electrons are moved and something you're going to be responsible for to make sure we're moving them and have enough of them, we've been told that about 2 million uh, megawatts of power is, is being uh, held off of the grid because it's, uh, it, the, the capacity is not there. So, Mr. Rosner, starting with you on, on the transmission and both the pipeline concerns that we have and transmission backlogs, uh, what, what's your concerns on that and that 2 million megawatts of power sitting on the sidelines that we're going to be needing sooner or later as we continue to transition this economy. Thank you for the question, Senator. I, I, the, the, the interconnection queue, as you mentioned, has, has approximately 2 million megawatts hours of generation waiting to connect. Um, this, this is an economic opportunity for the country. Um, timely uh, build out of infrastructure is, is essential, and if honored to be confirmed, that would be a priority for me. See. I certainly agree about the importance of needed transmission and making sure that that can take place in an orderly and predictable fashion. Um, and I know, Chair Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the idea of pipeline infrastructure. I think it's also important for FERC to take that part of its responsibility under the Natural Gas Act seriously when it comes to a thorough and efficient review. As Congress has placed the responsibility on FERC to have plentiful and affordable both natural gas and electric supply, I support the building out of infrastructure, energy infrastructure, to make sure that we have reliable energy services across the country. And finally, uh, today America is producing, as you've seen, more energy than ever in the history of our country. We're producing more oil, was 4.7 billion barrels last year, 37, almost 38 trillion cubic feet of gas. And we have produced more uh, energy from wind and solar than ever before. So with all this tremendous amount of energy we're producing, and the demands we have and also our responsibility for our allies around the world. What's your opinion of what we're doing, the mix and things of that sort? And we'll start back, Ms. Chang, with you. Uh, because some people are going to look at different, some have preferences of what fuel you like over another. And if you're truly looking at everything we're doing today, we're moving in that direction to be totally independent and we should stay that way. But I don't know if you have an opinion on that or not, how we've come to this energy security. Thank you very much for that question. I think first and foremost, that brings U.S. to be the competitive, um, invest in its competitive edge and comp being a strong competitor around the world and being a leader in all technologies in energy production. So I do think that's a positive story for the U.S. and leading in its efforts, both in investments that we are making today and have made in the past to make sure that that happens and support our allies through this energy security issue. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I, this is an exciting time for the country. It's a very, the story you just described is a very positive and exciting one, um, and one that uh, has, has served our co economy well by creating jobs uh, and by creating opportunities uh, across the, the resource mix. I see. I certainly agree that I think we have a, a wonderful opportunity when we see the new technologies that are developing. I think we would be proud of our existing resources and what we are doing as a country. Certainly important policy issues there. And when it comes to the Commission's role, it's to be fuel neutral, of course, when it comes to regulation of the organized markets. But I think it's important to look at the um, cr critical value that each of those sources is providing to our mix. Thank you. Thank you all. Senator Barrasso. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sharon. Uh, Ms. Chang, are natural gas prices in Massachusetts too high? Certainly in the winter, Senator, and I completely appreciate your concern because it is my concern as well to have affordable energy in Massachusetts and in New England because I and my family pay for those costs. And while I was in Massachusetts state government, 
We are deeply concerned about the costs associated, yeah. particularly with uh, low and moderate income. Well, that's good to hear because the behavior of the state of Massachusetts doesn't really seem to be focused on lowering the cost for people. You know, in 2018, uh, the Washington Examiner reported that you, quote, predicted New England will move away from natural gas within the next five years. So that was 18. We're now beyond that. And I think you said, quote, so it's fiscally irresponsible, your words, to invest in pipelines. Uh, that article was published six years ago. To na today, natural gas is supplying about the same share of New England's energy as it was in 2018. And you just said you support building out in energy infrastructure. Uh, does that include pipelines then? Absolutely. Because you, you didn't support it in 2018. Well, in 2018, I was merely interviewed on a uh, particular I, um, a, a article, but as a as We've a We've all been government. subject to being merely interviewed for articles, and we know how it uh, how Yes, it we do know how that goes. And as part of the state government, however, I personally experienced what it's like to go through winters in New England, and from the governor all the way down, we uh, nail-biting experiences to make sure that uh, we have not only reliable service, but affordable service. And that is particularly the time when New England is more like Germany than it was for, like Pennsylvania in its cost and availability of natural gas. Because so on, I, on I Monday, care deeply about that. On Monday, ISO New England, which keeps the grid in balance, uh, they issued a full report that I have here. And it says New England's future grid the future grid for New England may lack sufficient natural gas pipeline infrastructure to meet the region's winter fuel demand. You talked prices too high in the winter. The winter's fuel demand for both home heating and power generation. So it is a crisis point, potentially, for New England because of lack of pipeline availability. So in light of this fact, do you still think it's fiscally irresponsible to invest in pipelines? I think the issue is very complex in New England. Well, and it's a pretty simple I support, yes or no with everybody saying yeah, they need more pipelines. Is it fiscally irresponsible? Well, if I had my magic wand, I would love to have more gas infrastructure and gas supply to New England, but the issues are complicated in New England, and I look forward to an opportunity Thank to work Ms. further C, on that. If confirmed, would you, how would you assess the scope of the Commission's authority? Well, Ranking Member, yes, I, I understand that you, Congress, have given FERC important responsibility in the Federal Power Act and the National Gas Act of ensuring affordable and reliable energy through the regulated wholesale rates and mandatory reliability states, um, standards in the interstate electricity market, and also licensing efficiently needed infrastructure, including natural gas pipeline infrastructure. That's exactly what the Natural Gas Act says. These are important roles. We'd be committed to carrying them out. As I mentioned in my statement, I also think it's important I understand the role of the Commission to fulfill only those duties that Congress has delegated, because, of course, agencies don't have any independent authority. So I would consider it my duty, um, if I had the honor to be confirmed, to implement the laws that you, as the people's representatives, put into place. I have a question for all three of you. Let me start with Ms. C, and then we'll go to Mr. Rosner, and then ask Ms. Chang as well. So in late January, President Biden publicly stated that the Department of Energy would stop approving new liquefied natural gas, LNG exports, uh, for an indefinite period of time. Now, under the Natural Gas Act, the Commission is obligated to process permits for the siting, the construction, and the operation of the LNG export facilities. So I'd like to hear from each of you, if confirmed, will you commit to acting promptly on pending LNG export projects? Yes, Senator. As you said, Congress has divided authority in this area between the Department of Energy and FERC. I understand that directive to apply to the Department of Energy's role when it comes to licensing the export. I do not understand that to change FERC's statutory responsibility when it comes to timely and, and, and efficiently processing any licensing applications that come before it. Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, FERC is independent. Uh, of the Biden administration, uh, and FERC has its own uh, duty under the statute to um, review these projects. And uh, if honored to be confirmed, I, I would uh, support FERC's longstanding practice of proceeding to review applications when they're ready. Please. Ms. Chang. Yes, thank you for the question. And I also understand that FERC continues to process its uh, applications and uh, and I look forward to, if I have an opportunity, to work with the staff and other commissioners on this topic. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And now we have Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
I want to start by just making all three of you aware of an issue that I think is important that hasn't necessarily received the attention it deserves. Um, FERC Order 2023 um, created a certain system of financial de deposits with respect to interconnection queues that are are creating particular challenges in Indian country. And um, I want to ask a question, and it's relatively straightforward, is just that all three of you would commit to engaging tribal stakeholders as part of the FERC rulemaking process. Yes, absolutely. Um, certainly understand the concerns and the cost. And um, if I have the fortune to be confirmed, I would look very closely at this issue and how it affects affects our tribal nations. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Rosser. Thank you for the question, Senator. My answer is yes. Great. Ms. C. I, I agree. I think that diverse voices are very important when it comes to these issues. It's a matter of due process and accountability of the government's work. Uh, Ms. C., um, I very much understand and appreciate your firm belief uh, in the separation of powers between state and federal regulators. Um, I want to ask, given the vast majority of reliability issues result from outages that are actually caused by state-regulated distribution systems, how do you reconcile FERC's authority with its responsibility to ensure grid reliability? Thank you, Senator. As certainly, as we have all said, grid reliability is a central goal and responsibility. I think that implicates a couple aspects of the Commission's authority. I would certainly be looking closely at its um, authority under Section 215 of the Federal Power Act when it deals with mandatory reliability standards. I think that's critically important. And then, of course, looking for the way that um, the Commission's rate-making authority power in the organized markets would create market conditions for the right incentives to make sure we're benefiting ratepayers, which would include, of course, affordable rates and also um, adequate resources. Do you think we need clear um, uh, standards for what actually constitutes reliability? I think clarity is very important when it comes to regulation. Um, this is an area that I would be looking forward to if I were honored to be confirmed, looking closer with my um, fellow commissioners, and would certainly in this and in all other areas defer to Congress if it decides that it is important to provide more clarity in the law. Uh, Mr. Rosner, this committee has heard testimony from, from FERC, from NERC, from industry, all stating that interregional transmission is really critical to ensuring reliability, especially in the face of increasing extreme weather events. Uh, I'm curious if you agree with that, and if so, would you commit to ensuring a final rule uh, with strong provisions on interregional transmission capacity? Thank you for the question, Senator. And, uh, I, I, um, I, I agree um, this is a critically important issue. Uh, the committee, as you mentioned, has heard from the experts at NERC, the other commissioners at FERC, and industry about how the promise of interregional transmission as one of the solutions to some of the uh, major threats to reliability that our country has faced uh, in the past decade. Um, if confirmed, um, I, can, I would say that this would be a priority for me. And I would uh, like to um, work with my colleagues, uh, if, if honored to be confirmed, on um, potential uh, actions that the commission could take um, on this. Thank you. Ms. Chang and Ms. C, I would just ask your thoughts on the importance of interregional transmission um, and whether that should be thoroughly considered by FERC in order to ensure the, the kind of grid reliability that you all seem to support. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Senator, for that question. As you probably know, I have been analyzing interregional and regional transmission efforts and, of this country, and I do think that um, there are many benefits associated with, economic benefits associated with building out our transmission infrastructure, including interregional transmission. So if I were to have the fortune to be confirmed that is also one of my priorities to better understand the constraints and work with states and all stakeholders and the regional entities to make sure that um, we can advance the transmission build out of this country. Ms. C. I think there's a lot of agreement that it's important in order for reliability to get energy from where it's produced to the people who need it when and where they do. I think transmission is a very important um, issue when it comes to that goal. Um, so certainly I do support uh, the you know, orderly build out of needed transmission facilities. I understand the importance of this role and if I had the honor to be confirmed, would look forward to working with my fellow commissioners and the FERC staff on these issues. Great. 
Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to each of you uh, for your willingness to serve and be here with us today. Mr. Rosner, let's start with you. Um, you know, the electri uh, electric transmission is uh, a hot topic. It's a hot topic here in Congress and a hot topic within FERC. Would you agree that the cost of uh, transmission lines ought to be borne by and, and, and imposed only on those who directly and quantifiably benefit from those lines? Thank you for the question, Senator. I, I, I agree that uh, only those who benefit should pay for transmission, uh, and that is consistent with longstanding commission uh, precedent as well as uh, judicial uh, precedent on this topic. Uh, thank you. Now, Ms. C, states like California have adopted some, some of their own standards, their own uh, renewable portfolio standards. Um, and, and those require significant uh, transmission infrastructure in order to wheel in uh, renewable generation from other areas of the country. Should FERC require Utah's ratepayers to pay for California's future transmission projects, uh, which will be built solely for the purpose of, uh, uh, of satisfying California's public policy goals? Uh, Senator, uh, I would certainly respect the responsibility of the states when it comes to their primary decisions and their own policies and generation. But when I'm looking at FERC's particular role, uh, I agree with Mr. Rosner that there is longstanding um, commission precedent when it comes to the idea that costs need to be commensurate to the benefits. I think that's critically important. And in any of these issues that were coming in front of me, I would be looking at um, who is benefiting in that case um, when it comes to the particular uh, issues of cost allocation. I would be looking very closely at the law and the um, commission's role in that area and applying it to the particular factors in front of me. But the Commission's job is not to uh, socialize the cost from one state to another in order to satisfy that state's policy desires. It's not the other state's job to pay for those. It's certainly not FERC's job to require State A to subsidize State B in its own policy preferences. I, I think it's certainly important for the Commission to be looking at what it looks like to have um, fair allocation in terms of just and reasonable rates. And yes, I would be looking very closely at that statutory authority in any of these questions. Ms. Chang, do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. I also agree with the fact that beneficiaries pay in the context of transmission cost allocation. So, yes. Great. Mr. Rosner, you agree with that also? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, clearly, the idea of beneficiary pays is easy to agree to in principle, um, the, but harder uh, in the context of, of paying for specific transmission projects. So I'd, I'd urge each of you uh, to be very careful as you na navigate this issue of who pays. The who pays question is significant. Uh, the question about uh, that, you know, that you're not socializing the cost for transmission projects to ratepayers, um, it's an important thing for you to focus on. Uh, ratepayers that will not benefit from those projects and didn't have a say in the climate policies uh, that have been adopted in other states. Uh, uh, other states uh, where the ratepayers in question do not live. Ms. Cheng, in your view, is FERC uh, fundamentally an economic or environmental regulator? Economic regulator. Mr. Rosner, do you agree with that? I do. And Ms. C? Yes. Mr. Rosner, uh, federal courts have long recognized FERC as an agency with no inherent powers beyond those specifically granted by Congress. The D.C. Circuit uh, held in Atlantic City Electric versus FERC that FERC is, quote, a creature of statute, uh, one that has no constitutional or common law existence or authority, but only those authorities conferred on it by Congress. In your view, Mr. Rosner, should FERC be in the business of regulating environmental and climate impacts beyond what NEPA requires? Thank you for the question, uh, and I, I agree strongly that if honored to be confirmed, my starting point in considering questions that come before the commission would be the statute. And I think in, in the case that you're, you're mentioning here, um, that would be the Natural Gas Act. And I would look to the Natural Gas Act, and the text that the Supreme Court has said that the, nat the purpose of the Natural Gas Act is to ensure the orderly development of plentiful supplies of natural gas at reasonable price. And so that's where I would start and end in my analysis of that issue. Thank you. Ms. Chang, is it appropriate uh, under the law for FERC to regulate downstream emissions for a natural gas pipeline project? Uh, 
My understanding is that the Natural Gas Act does not specify greenhouse gas emissions as a criteria for denying any pipeline projects. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, can I ask one follow-up? Uh, uh, now, um, in a Citizens Climate Forum panel, um, you spoke about how climate transmission ref uh, w will reform, quote, um, really everything we do, the way we do things will need to change between now and 2050 beyond, of course. What role do you think FERC should play in the climate change transformation that you describe in that speech? In that context of the quote that you just cited, Senator, it's about our individual lives and, sure. the, and our personal contribution to the climate crisis that we face. Uh, as far as FERC's role is concerned, I, if I have the honor to be confirmed, I will make sure that I follow the law and Congress is in the position to set the law and FERC is an agency that follows the law. But, but should, should climate change factor into FERC's public interest determinations? I understand your question and I understand the, the tension around this topic. I am not a lawyer, so I haven't reviewed all the court cases around this topic, but I would commit to my to you and everyone here that Based I will Based on your understanding of those laws, should it? Uh, again, I mentioned that the National Gas Act does not specify climate change in its determination Thank of you. natural Th gas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, weigh in here with so many references to California. Uh, but first, uh, I want to take a moment uh, and thank uh, Mr. Rosner, who's before us, for his work as a detailee to the committee. I know his expertise has been a tremendous uh, resource for me, for my staff, I imagine for many offices of uh, committee members uh, during his time. So very much appreciate that and has, I think, prepared you well for this uh, uh, opportunity here. Uh, uh, speaking of uh, California and the West for that matter, uh, much of the West uh, grid reliability struggles have intensified in recent years, not just because of a growing population and economy, but because of the extreme summer heat uh, and the strain that it imposes on the system. Now, Western grid regionalization has been raised as a potential solution to these concerns. As electricity demand in the West continues to grow and stressors continue to intensify, uh, the ability for regions to coordinate and the speed and sophistication of that coordination grows more important every single day. And I'm seeing some heads nodding in, in uh, agreement here. So in December of last year, FERC approved the California ISO's proposal to establish the extended day ahead market, which would allow external balancing authority areas to participate in California ISO's day ahead market. This is a major step towards a more reliable and resilient grid. Question is for Ms. Cheng. Can you discuss how regional coordination can improve efficiency, can reduce cost, and can reduce emissions in a region? Thank you, Senator, for that question. I happen to have worked on some regional market analyses in the West, uh, including uh, assisting many stakeholders, including California ISO, to analyze these things. And my position on that is I do believe regional market can bring benefits to ratepayers, to consumers, because of the things that you had just mentioned. It, it could increase the efficient use of transmission as well as resources. And therefore, um, if I have the honor to be confirmed, I would work very closely with other staff and commissioners on this topic. Thank you, Senator. Okay, thank you. You anticipated my follow-up question, which is, should you be fortunate enough to be confirmed, would you be supportive of allowing for flexibility amongst regions to collaborate on market development? Yes, absolutely. I think I have great respect for uh, all the states across the West, as well as their utilities, to make the choices of the market design and the market that they want to participate in. Right, and uh, before I ask my next question, just a, a comment, Senator Lee had to excuse himself, I see, but in the whole beneficiary pays <laughs> conversation, uh, the benefits of such coordination and uh, efficiencies, et cetera, are not contained to the footprint of the state boundaries of California. In fact, the, benef the, uh, the benefits uh, are regional, and so, uh, 
whether it's through coordination, whether it's through infrastructure upgrades, uh, I'll just uh, state that for the record. Uh, now, on a different topic, uh, FERC has such an important mission. I mean, you all agree that's why you're here today, uh, accepting the nomination. Uh, the mission of assisting consumers in obtaining reliable, safe, secure, and efficient energy services at a reasonable cost. So the cost impacts aren't lost on us. However, in order to do that, in order to fulfill its mission, FERC must be fully staffed, especially with the technical experts necessary to carry out its very important work. And as you've seen across the federal government, recruiting and retaining technical staff in particular at times can be challenging. With millions of megawatts currently in the approval queue at FERC, we must ensure that FERC has not just the commissioners it needs, but the staff capacity and expertise required to carry out its mission effectively and timely. Uh, Mr. Rosner, given your experience as a staff member at FERC, can uh, you share with us how important it is to have the adequate amount of technical staff? Thank you for the, for the question, Senator. Uh, and I, I, can, I, I would agree that, that having, the, having a fully staffed agency with, the, the, with staff that has the right expertise to process the issues before it is essential. Thank you. And I think final question for all the commissioners. Uh, should you be fortunate enough to be confirmed, how would you use your platform as a commissioner uh, to work with Congress to increase staffing at FERC and uh, oppose uh, proposed budget cuts? I'm happy to start. Being in public service right now, I, I recognize that they're incredibly delicate, uh, dedicated and talented people who work there. I do understand some of those recruiting challenges. I have experienced that in my current role. Um, that would something that would be very important to me to look into if I had the honor to be confirmed to see what current conditions are in the commission. And I'd certainly be committed to working with Congress on any issues there. Thank you. Mr. Rosner. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. I, I, I commit to, to working with you and, and the members of this committee on, on this question and uh, that it would be a priority to ensure a fully staffed uh, agency. Thank you. thank you. I too appreciate the uh, value of having adequate staff and I commit to, to you here at the committee as well as the chairman of FERC to work on this topic if I were to be confirmed. Thank you. Okay. Thank all three of you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here and testifying. That's very much appreciated. You know, we know the importance of FERC's role when it comes to ensuring reliable and reasonable rates for the electric grid. Its very mission statement notes the responsibility to ensure, and I quote, reliable, safe, secure, and economically efficient energy services at a reasonable cost. Nowhere does it mention being an environmental policy-making body. A quick yes or no down the panel for this question, because my time is limited. Is FERC an economic regulator and not an environmental policy-making body? Yes. 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 Thank you for that. We've seen in years past, and even recently, how other agencies have proposed what I consider major overreaching policies without consulting FERC, that would dramatically impact the reliability of the grid that we all depend on. If confirmed, will you be willing to challenge faulty assumptions of other agencies if they threaten grid reliability? I will start, Senator, by saying that, again, reliability is foundational, and it's foundational to FERC's role. So to the extent that anything that might affect the reliability of our systems, energy systems, and electric grid, I will work very hard with other agencies in case those policies affect them to ensure that we have the proper levers for FERC to ensure reliability. Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the question, Senator. and, and uh, as uh, the job number one for the commission is to ensure energy reliability for the country. And if uh, there were a case where um, the reliability of the grid or the energy system were um, in question, I would without hesitation communicate those concerns. Ms. C. 
Um, Senator, yes, I certainly agree that I think it's important to look at all of the intersecting landscape when it comes to different legal requirements from different agencies. Um, that's something that in my role as an advocate, not of course as an impartial commissioner, I've been thinking about a lot over the past couple of years in my role in West Virginia. So I think that that is a very important concern. And certainly agencies each have their own responsibility consistent with the authorities that Congress has given to them. But because FERC does have responsibility as an economic regulator and responsible for reliability, I think it is important to share those important perspectives. I, I applaud, for instance, the technical conference that FERC held when it talked about reliability issues and on proposed rules from other agencies this fall. I think that expert consulting and advising role is very important in this space. Thank you all. In previous years, legislation has been introduced already in the U.S. Senate to amend the Natural Gas Act to give FERC refund authority in cases where natural gas transmission pipelines charge unfair, unreasonable rates to their customers. FERC has this existing authority under the Federal Power Act in terms of unfair rates charged by electric utilities. Missy, we'll start with you. So how do you view these overcharges affecting natural gas consumers like my constituents who rely on natural gas to cook, to heat their homes, to heat their poultry houses, everything that uh, Mississippians do? Could or do these overcharges lead to higher rates? Senator, I think these are also incredibly important issues. And as you said, when it comes to affordability, that's not just an abstract concept. It matters to everyday Americans in their day-to-day -day lives. So I think that's a very important issue. I'd be looking very closely at FERC's authority in this area. I would be committed to applying the statute and the Natural Gas Act standards in the particular circumstances and facts that came before me. I certainly respect and understand the discussion that this committee is having and is having in Congress. And of course, on this and other issues, would defer to Congress if Congress decided it was important to give more clarity and direct authority in that space. Thank you. Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the question, and uh, I, I think uh, re reasonable price and affordability is, is a key concern and will be a priority for me if honored to be confirmed. Um, on this specific question, I would be, um, uh, again, if confirmed, I would, I would like to uh, provide any technical support, technical assistance to you or your staff or this committee as they consider um, potential changes to the statute. Thank you, Senator, for that question. I, too, will commit to working with you and your staff to, to better understand the issue. And, uh, of course, one of the primary jobs of FERC is to make sure that the costs are just and reasonable. And uh, I would, of course, also support any enforcement actions that the Office of Enforcement would be working. So I would commit to working with you and your staff and other um, FERC uh, staff to better understand this issue and work on that topic. Thank you. Thank you. My time is out. Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here and for your willingness to engage in this level of public service. Um, we've had NERC come in here and testify to us that many of our nation grids face serious reliability issues. We've touched on that a little bit already. NERC said unequivocally, um, one intervention that would be beneficial to reliability is new interregional transmission. Uh, we introduced big wires to try and help coordinate that uh, interregional uh, grid build out. But FERC actually has existing authority to establish minimum, a minimum transfer standard and hosted a staff level workshop in 2022 on the topic. So, just each of you down the road, and I've got a couple other questions. So, do you agree with NERC and what value do you see in a, in a federal tr minimum transfer standard? Uh, and will you commit, if you are confirmed, to exploring the benefits of establishing minimum transfer capabilities between regions? Thank you, Senator, for that question. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a big believer in making sure that we have reliable service, including building necessary and beneficial infrastructure, including interregional trans transmission uh, facilities. I, um, I do think, in general, uh, and ideally, we would love to have standard across the country. Um, however, I respect regional differences, and I understand there might be regional differences in needs and priorities. So to the extent that minimum transfer standards would be applied, I would 
love to have an opportunity to work more on that and understand the regional differences and the priorities. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question, Senator, and thank you for your leadership on this topic. Uh, I, I um, do, uh, do agree with the NERC's assessment that, that interregional transmission is one of the key solutions to the um, weather-driven uh, grid reliability challenges that our nation faces, and then getting bigger than the weather is, is a potential solution to those, among others. Um, if honored to be confirmed, I would uh, be delighted to um, consider uh, ways, along with my colleagues, on how to uh, find a solution to that reliability threat. Thank you. And Senator, I also, of course, agree with the concerns to reliability, and I think it's important to look at all options that could help us address that problem to the benefit of rate makers. Um, I, I think certainly there are going to be specific circumstances in different regions, as Ms. Chang mentioned, that would be important to look at. I, I'm familiar, but haven't had the chance to look in detail at the results of that staff, staff level conference. So I would certainly be interested, if I had the honor to be confirmed, to learn more about where that process stands and what the Commission learned from that on this issue. Great. Thank you, Ed. Um, I mean, whether it is uh, rising load electrification or the, the proliferation of data centers to the extreme weather, I mean, we are seeing that th these uh, challenges are going to increase. Um, and uh, you know, one of the studies that I found instructive from this from Iowa State looked at the years 2014 to 2021, um, and the whole of North America developed just seven gigawatts of large-scale interregional trans transmission over that seven-year period, so just seven gigawatts, and less than half of that was in the U.S., right? Seven gigawatts for all of North America. Uh, of that half, zero has been completed yet. Over the same period, South America developed 22 gigawatts, right? Well, we couldn't even do three and a half. Uh, Europe did 44 gigawatts, and China did 260 gigawatts. Um, and I think, you know, the key reliability challenges that are, are in front of us, uh, we haven't been facing them. Um, and given how long this infrastructure takes to build, are you worried that we are falling behind our peers in terms of the, uh, our interregional inter capacity? Let's we'll start down this end. Uh, Senator, I agree. I think there's been a theme this morning that in terms of having needed infrastructure build out, that is very important. And I, I would be looking at this issue in terms of what FERC's particular responsibilities and authorities are in that area. So I agree that this is an important question to make sure how can we encourage the right sort of investments. I would be looking that um, in the context of FERC's rate making authority, what it looks like in terms of its responsibility for just and reasonable rates and creating the right market incentives to be able to have the important reliability and resource adequacy that we need for consumers across the country in this and in other areas. Great. Thank you for the question, Senator. And, and it, it occurs to me that, that more often when reading the press, you, you, you read about transmission lines that have been in the permitting process to the extent that they're, if they were a person, they'd be old enough to vote. And um, <laughs> from my perspective, if honored to be confirmed, uh, it would be a priority for me to ensure timely uh, build of needed infrastructure. And Senator, as um, I've dedicated a lot of time in my career to understand the issues on regional and interregional transmission, and as you have stated correctly, that you know load is just growing. Data centers are coming in through different communities, and I am concerned about the reliability, but also the uh, the cost associated with energy uh, for different regions. So, to the extent that beneficial transmission and interregional beneficial transmission would be, uh, will be necessary and will be supportive. I, I dedicate my time to working on that. In addition, I also think long-term planning is a part of that. And I think that having proper long-term planning and outlook to what the growth might be and can be and will be, will be part of um, the work that's necessary for FERC to look at uh, how much transmission and where they ought to be cited. Thank you. Well, certainly as, as part of that long-term planning, you're, well, I talked to all three of you independently, but your collaborative efforts and you all agreed and committed to working together uh, collaboratively across the five-person commission. So that's much appreciated. Hopefully that long-range planning can be done in a shorter amount of time. Yield Absolutely. back to the chair. Uh, Senator Cassidy. Uh, thank you all. Appreciate your willingness to serve, really do. Um, so, um, 
Commissioner Danley's dissent on the interim greenhouse gas rule group policy statement has fueled discussion about whether FERC should deny projects based upon greenhouse gas impacts. And I'm going to ask you to answer quickly because I've got lots of questions. What is your perspective on whether FERC has the authority to incorporate uh, greenhouse gas emissions into commission reviews? Ms. Chang? According to the Natural Gas Act, the FERC does not, uh, it does not specify greenhouse gas as a criteria for evaluating natural gas pipelines. And so presumably, does that mean that you would not vote to deny a project based upon those emissions? I have not had a chance to review all the core cases uh, in detail. So my understanding is that current, the statute does not, uh, uh, does not specify greenhouse gas as a as a criteria to deny any gas pipeline. And so therefore would not, if it, it, let's just take the stipulate that it doesn't, would you therefore, since it doesn't include it, you, is that to just to stipulate that's going to hold to be the case, would you not use this as a criteria by which to deny a permit? Again, I will follow if, the if, law. If you I stipulate will, the law upholds this. That's right. If the law holds that as a criteria, as not as a criteria for denying gas pipeline, I will follow the law. Dr. Uh, Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the question, Senator. And um, my approach to this question, if honored to be confirmed, would be to first look at the statute. And the statute here uh, is the Natural Gas Act. And the Supreme Court has said the purpose of that statute is to ensure orderly development of plentiful supplies of natural gas. Now, some courts have said that the commission needs to consider certain greenhouse gas emissions um, and uh, what I can commit to you and this committee is to first and foremost follow the statute, which I just stated the purpose of that statute when making these decisions. Sounds great. And Ms. C? I, I certainly can't disagree with committing to follow the statute. Um, FERC has responsibility. Um, it does have environmental duties under NEPA, and I think it is important, of course, to follow existing law. So in terms of the information that FERC is looking at, it would be important to look at those, um, those effects that meet the legal requirements of reasonable foreseeability. But at the end of the day, yes, the rule is to follow the law and to look at the criteria that you as, as Congress have given to FERC when it comes I to I think I'm learning action. never ask an attorney for a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, Senator. Uh, uh, then let me talk, start with you, Ms. Cia. Um, Again, if you've got this, um, just real yes or no would be great. Should we continue knowing uh, the EIA calculates that natural gas generation is about 45% of kilowatt hours produced in the U.S. in 2023, and we'll need more of it by 2050, um, particularly as we continue to electrify many things. So to ask all of you, starting with you, Missy, uh, should we continue investing in the nation's natural gas infrastructure? Um, and what is your perspective on the role of natural gas in the U.S. energy system long term? Well, Senator, I think that you as Congress have told us the answer to that is yes in the Natural Gas Act, looking to the purposes of that statute. I also take seriously the concerns of reliability and the important role that natural gas plays in that. Sounds great. Mr. Rosner? Thank you for the question, Senator. And uh, I, I agree that um, the, if honored to be confirmed, uh, I would uh, be... Um, strongly committed to uh, the infrastructure that is needed to power our country. And you see a role for natural gas long term in our electrical grid? I, 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 I do. Yeah. Ms. Chang? I do as well. When analyzing into 2050, even in New England, we will need as much natural gas generation as we have today in, that, in uh, New England to facilitate the reliable grid. Now, some are, are suggesting that the, putting impediments towards pipeline development is a way to inhibit the use of natural gas and to augment the use of renewables, even if that imperils reliability. We've had a nice hearing uh, last year of people from the middle of the country talking about how having to take coal based offline is endangering the reliability of their grid. Um, so... Um, but this seems to be a strategy of different federal agencies. Now, that said, Ms. Chang, um, you've expressed a commitment to reliability and affordability. Um, do you see, what do you see, do you agree with using regulation as a way to inhibit the development of fossil fuels in its deployment for our grid? My understanding is under the Federal Power Act, FERC is actually, does not have jurisdiction over, per, uh, over uh, what resources to choose. So it's 
is technology neutral, it's an economic agency. And so it doesn't make decisions about which uh, facility, which, which power plants to, to actually build. Sounds great. Well, I'd like to ask the other two of you, but I'm out of time. I yield. Thank you. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Uh, thank you, all three of you, for your interest. Um, and um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. L I'm going to jump back to Chair Manchin and, and some of the questions that he uh, talked to you about. Uh, he here's what we know. Uh, we have made these big, bold investments in new generation. Uh, and they are crucial to our future. Uh, they are creating jobs. They're good for the economy. They're good for the climate. And we all uh, whether you want to pick what generation you want, but they're, uh, all of the above approach is good for this country and moving forward. But let me ask you this, because I'm hearing from grid operators that the existing power generating capacity is struggling to keep up with demand, um, and um, we need a timely uh, and efficient approval process for connecting this new generation. Uh, I also understand that while FERC's order number 2023 has provided helpful reforms to shorten the time it takes for these new projects to access the grid, more work needs to be done. So for the three of you, I mean, and I'll start with uh, Ms. Chang, what additional measures can be taken to enhance uh, FERC's interconnection process and streamline new energy projects and electricity resources online more quickly? A and just. Caveat, I'm working on regulation around this, so this is why this is important for me to have this conversation with the three of you. Ms. Chang. Yes, uh, I understand there's quite a number of reforms in Order 2023 from FERC. So if I were fortunate to be confirmed, I will continue to work with existing FERC commissioners and the talented staff to better understand what other per, uh, impediments or anything else that can be streamlined in the interconnecting new generation. I appreciate that, but let me just say, as the reports that I'm, I'm looking at show a staggering backlog of, what, 2,030 gigawatts of new generation and energy storage, as well as an average wait time of five years to connect to the grid. That's a problem. Mr. Rosner. Well, thank you for the question, and, and I, I agree that this, this is a concern. Uh, the country has a huge economic opportunity here, both in terms of connecting new technologies to the grid and also to meeting growing demand for new uh, industries. Um, so what I would say um, to this is, is that um, ensuring orderly and timely connection of resources to the grid would be a priority. Uh, I am uh, ha aware that uh, the commission promulgated order 2023. I believe that the, the, the first set of compliance with that is due uh, just next month, and, and if honored to be confirmed, I would work to ensure um, that uh, we keep a careful eye on that process and also look to solutions uh, to the extent that there are other um, opportunities to make that process more efficient. Thank you. Missy. I also agree that I think that this issue of interconnection is incredibly important, and when it comes to a reliable and transparent and efficient processes, I think that's an important part of the Commission's responsibility in ensuring just and reasonable rates and not being um, unduly discriminatory or preferential. I understand that there are ongoing proceedings about the Commission's current orders, so certainly would not want to prejudge anything there. And also in my current position as a nominee, I, I don't have access to the information from that comment process that led to that for why the Commission reached the certain um, approaches that it did did not go further or made those choices. Um, I, I would certainly be looking closely at this issue, and if I had the honor to be confirmed, would want to work closely with my fellow commissioners and FERC staff on this issue, and, and of course with you and the members of this committee. Thank you. Um, each of you in your written testimony today stressed the need for a more resilient and reliable grid. Uh, and as we all are aware, extreme re weather uh, is one of the primary causes of electric power outages. These events are only expected to increase in frequency uh, and severity over the next several decades. Uh, in fact, recent data from the U.S. Congress Joint Economic Committee found that weather-related events were responsible for 80 percent, 80 percent of all outages from 2000 to 2021. From each of your perspectives, how can FERC better ensure that transmission facilities are more resilient against the threats of extreme weather? And Missy, I'll start with you. Yes, I certainly recognize the um, important and serious concerns that extreme weather has when it comes to resiliency. I would be looking at this question as, as in any other issue from FERC's authorities. I would be looking at its responsibility for mandatory reliability standards and its oversight of NERC. I think that would be the appropriate way to start. And then also to take account of this issue when it comes to its role as a uh, rate maker and uh, regulator in the wholesale markets. Thank you. Mr. Rosner? 
Thanks for the question, Senator. And uh, I, I agree that um, in, in terms of the challenges that, that our grid faces over the coming decades, that this hot and cold weather event issue is, is at the top of the list. And, um, and I believe that the statistics is in five of the last 11 years, we've had power outages or grid emergencies as a result of it. So it, what I would say is that I'm, I'm encouraged um, that, um, that there has been some action at the commission to promulgate uh, cold weather, hot and cold weather standards that I, I hope will improve this. In the event that there's more to do, which it sounds like there likely is, given the what what this committee has heard in the last year, I, I'm committed to working and prioritizing that issue. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Chang. Thank you, Senator, for that question. It's actually something that I hold close to my heart, and I happen to have worked on some at the very minimal looking at this issue. It's actually. Uh, quite complex and uh, extremely critical that um, extreme weather events are affecting not just transmission, but all assets on the grid, but also as we plan for the future, we have to make sure that the infrastructure can withstand extreme weather events physically and as a system. So I definitely commit to work with you and your staff and also other folks uh, at uh, FERC to make sure that we do better as a country for resiliency. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And welcome to the committee. Thank you all for your willingness to, to participate and to serve. Um, I do think it's remarkable this morning that we have three, uh, three nominees for these for positions. Um, I think it's important that this committee is taking this up in a manner that is pretty civilized and um, uh, not pitting, uh, pitting individuals against one another or um, uh, kind of the political trading that's going, that goes back and forth, that we have uh, qualified nominees that are before us, and uh, I, I appreciate the process that we actually have. So um, I've had an opportunity over the years to, 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 to speak with so many different commissioners there at the FERC, and what I look for in a FERC nominee is I want to know that commissioners will operate with a level of independence, that you bring to the table the expertise that is needed, and that you also act with the urgency that, um, that is needed to develop the policies that we need at this time. It's been noted, it is unprecedented actually, what is, what is coming on in terms of the increased demand here in this country and how we're going to be competitive um, globally. It, it comes down to, to our, our energy supply, our power supply in this, in this country and how we knit it all together and FERC is so fundamental to all of that. So I wanna just ask a question to each of you about prioritization, because we talk about reliable and affordable. You have been quizzed by everybody here about, you know, are you an economic regulator or an environmental? I think you've all answered uh, appropriately, but but ultimately it comes down to to how do you how do you prioritize all of this? How do you address climate change into this regulatory process of FERC? And and do you but how do you deal then with the pressure that you're going to get from an administration that's laying that down on you? So I come from a state, as you probably know, where reliability is key, but affordability is, is absolutely essential. When it's 40 below, it's not like you have the option to, to not, um, not have, have power in your home for, for heat but sometimes that comes at extraordinary cost, so you're actually forced to choose between energy and other necessities. So share with me very briefly, because I have a very important question after this, how you would prioritize between reliability, affordability, and emissions reductions. And if you only had to pick two, which one are you gonna prioritize? We're gonna start with you, Ms. C. Well, I think, again, I would start by following the law and the particular laws that apply to FERC. If, if I can only pick those two, I'm going to pick the two that are in the laws that Congress has put into place, and that is going to be reliability and affordability. 
Okay, thank you. Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, I, I, for me, the priority is reliability, and I think that comes hand in hand with affordability, because without reliability, nothing else really matters. Uh, however, balance is also appropriate, and, 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 and the statute uh, provides the balance. If honor to be confirmed, I would drive my decisions off of the statute, court precedent, and I also would do so uh, in a way that working with colleagues to find bipartisan, or in many cases, the issues you just rose, I think are nonpartisan issues. Um, I think a lot of these issues are um, fuel neutral. They're, they're good of the country questions that um, what I hope is to work on durable bipartisan or nonpartisan solutions with uh, colleagues at the commission. So thank you for the question. Ms. Chang. Thank you very much for the question. I completely share your thought process and, um, and the need to balance and choose if necessary. I do think reliability is foundational because in this country, no one will, will tolerate a significant outage of anything. And as you say, and I share this from New England, when it's 30 below, uh, there's really no choice but to have sufficient amount of energy to heat our homes and to, to power our, our appliances. So uh, reliability is still number one, and it's an uh, economic engine of our country. So very quickly, because this is a very important question, and we've been talking a lot about natural gas, but there's more out there beyond natural gas. And I want to talk hydropower for just a moment here, because these small-scale hydro projects, certainly in my state, are making a huge difference in, in reducing the reliance on costly diesel fuel. This is gonna be important for us going forward, but we're far from our potential um, on hydro, and, and not only in Alaska, but across the country here. But part of this is due to the challenges that are related to the permitting and licensing, and, and just the time that is involved and the cost that is involved. So certainly, timeliness, regulatory certainty, these are two of the five guiding principles there for FERC. But do you think that the current regulatory process to license and relicense hydro projects actually represents these values? And I'll give you a hint. I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I would hope that within the FERC, you would agree that improving these processes would be a priority there at FERC. Is everybody nodding their heads? Yes, yes, and I just want to add, I am uh, also share your um, interest and understand the value of hydro, large hydro and small hydro in Massachusetts in, in the same situation where uh, I see a lot of value in, in developing small hydro, and I do think it's uh, improving any kind of uh, streamlining the process would be, uh, would be extremely important. Thank you, Senator. I'm assuming the two of you agree on that? Yes. Ms. C? Yes. Thank you. And I'm going to invite each of you, should you be confirmed, to please come to Alaska. I'm not going to ask you to come for a quick weekend. I'm going to ask you to commit to multiple days. You probably need five days to see and understand what we're talking about here. Um, I know everyone looks for a good family vacation, and we can work, and we can play at the same time. Thank I want to just say for my whole family, we are looking forward to that opportunity. Thank good. you, Senator. <laughs> Senator good. King. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I hope it's not an omen that when Senator Murkowski started talking about civility, someone in the audience started to cry. Uh, uh, and I suspect I may be the only member of the United States Senate who's ever applied to FERC for a permit. Uh, so I understand the questions that Senator Mikowski was, was asking. Um, we've all been talking about grid expansion and the necessity for an enormous expansion of grid capacity over the next 30 to 40 years as our nation electrifies in a whole, a whole series of different ways. Uh, we've got reliability. You all talked about it. I'm worried about cost. Uh, our electric ratepayers are hurting. And for the first time in my memory, the cost of, of transmission and distribution is exceeding the cost of generation. And that's only going to increase as we go along. My concern is that when we are talking about grid expansion, we first talk about ways to provide additional reliability and capacity 
without necessarily entirely rebuilding the grid infrastructure. For example, these, these are, this is the current conductor on a high voltage transmission line. This is a new uh, innovation uh, carbon base that will transfer twice the amount of power with less line losses than the conventional wire. The point I'm making is we need to insist that those who are be, going to be rebuilding the grid do so in the most cost-effective way. Uh, now, this is more expensive, I suspect, but, the, but, the, but to double the transmission without having to build new towers, new right-of-way, all of those kinds of things, and as you know, there are, there's something called GETS, Grid Enhancing Technologies. How can FERC improve or ensure that we do GETS first before we fall back on the more expensive construction option? Ms. Jang? Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, that's another topic that I have uh, invested a lot of time thinking through. And I, too, like you, um, believe in advanced technology and we should use to the best possible possible way to dynamic use advanced technology rating, to... Dynamic, dynamic line rating demand yes, response. Yes, to advance our, um, our infrastructure. And as you said, if we can double, and I have heard that dynamic line rating can double some facilities' out, uh, throughput um, and reconductoring with higher, uh, better technology, the innovation of this country well, should be a leading edge. I, and I and agree with everything. That I think, the, but the question is, how does FERC incent these kinds of developments as opposed to uh, the conventional rate rate base uh, incentive to, toward construction? That's, I think that's the issue. Mr. Rosner, your, your thoughts on that question? Well, thank you for the question, Senator. And, and I would just say at a high level, doing more with less is just common sense. And that is a mindset that I, if honored to be confirmed, would bring to the commission. Um, I, I think you're alluding to some of the barriers uh, of, of associated with um, incentives to deploy. Correct. Um, and um, Show me your incentives and I'll show you the results. <laughs> exactly. And, and um, if honored to be confirmed, um, it, it would uh, be a priority for me to um, consider uh, whether there are ways that the commission could overcome those incentives. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. C? I, I think it's certainly important that we have so many new developing technologies. I think that's a really important time in the country we're in, an important issue for FERC. I think it's important to respond to all of these two new technologies consistent with FERC's statutory authority, and I, and I believe that means... Well, the statutory authority is affordability, which talks about uh, just and reasonable rates. I would right. say rates aren't reasonable if they're not based upon the most effective, cost-effective technology. I, I, I certainly think that that affordability principle is very important, and also the principle when it comes to equal access to the market. I think technologies that are able to provide services, it's baked into the statute that they should have that equal opportunity to compete for the ability to provide. I think that's important when FERC is fulfilling this role. Thank you very much. Um, in a uh, very short period of time, I think I'll leave this question for the record, perhaps. Uh, in New England, anyway, and in many parts of the country, the gas pipeline system is essentially part of the grid. Sixty percent of our electricity in New England is made for, is, comes from natural gas. There's no natural gas in New England. We haven't figured out how to make energy from granite yet. Uh, should not we be thinking about the regulation of the natural gas pipeline system as part of the electric grid? Because if the gas pipeline goes down, you can have the most reliable grid in the world, but that grid's going to go down. Ms. C? I certainly share the concerns about reliability for the natural gas sector, and I think that this is an area uh, where, where, as I have said before, I would defer to Congress's leadership if there is more responsibility and who the appropriate regulator is in that space. Thank you. Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the, for the question, and uh, I, I share your concern uh, in this area. Um, I, I, again, um, echo um, my, my colleague here that, that uh, uh, would be delighted to provide you and the members of the committee with technical uh, assistance um, on this question. Um, and uh, if honored to be confirmed, uh, I would uh, also work within the commission's I, statutory I authority. I don't have a predetermined answer on this question. I, I just think it's something we need to be thinking about. Understood. Ms. Chang? I agree with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's nice to see you sitting in that chair, Mr. Chairman. It's, that looks, thank you. Yeah, yeah looks good. Um, Congratulations to all the nominees. Thank you for being here. Let me start with 
an issue that's very important to the state that I represent. In the Infrastructure Act that Congress passed a year or two ago, the bill amend, now law, amended the Federal Power Act Section 216, which allows now FERC to designate certain areas as national transmission corridors in the states under certain conditions. There's a three-part test, but, uh, but uh, uh, the three-part test is disjunctive. Uh, which means that uh, if FERC were to find that the state agency, regulatory agency, was not acting within a certain amount of time or pursuant to certain conditions, FERC could step in and say, okay, this is going to be a national transmission corridor. We will approve it. We will send it forward. Why does that matter to the state of Missouri? We have a transmission line called the Grain Belt Express. It's 800 miles. It connects, runs right across the middle of Missouri. It's meant to connect Kansas wind farms to consumers on the East Coast. To say that farmers in my state have been concerned about this would be a dramatic understatement. Dramatic. Not least because, as originally planned, this express transmission line contained zero power for the state of Missouri. And then the corporation that is in charge of it, which is now Invenergy, it's changed hands a few times, but now it's Invenergy, and their CEO was was before us not long ago, Invenergy has, has freely used the power of eminent domain to seize farmers' land. When, when farmers, you can appreciate, many of these farmers have been there for generations. And these are small farms. These are not corporate farms. This is their livelihood. And they said, no, I said, we don't, we don't want the transmission line to run through our farm. It's going to disrupt our, our farming. Many of them don't own very many acres. And Invenergy has said, oh, it's too bad. We're going to come in. We're going to take it. And by the way, you're going to get no power out of it. Now, they've since amended it. Missouri's going to get a little bit of power. But it's still going right across the middle of the state. Here's what I'd like to hear from each of you. We'll start with you, Ms. C, and, and come down the, down the line there. Will you be wary of using this power that you now have under Section 216 to essentially Bigfoot state authorities and state regulatory agencies to, to uh, sidestep them which, if FERC were to do that, would also sidestep all of the local citizens. You know, if, if FERC were to come in and to say, uh, we're going to designate this as a national transmission corridor, farmers in Missouri would have no recourse. I mean, at least under the current law, they can go to the state agency, and have, they have done so. But if FERC is to get involved and, just, and, and take over the process, their voices would be completely cut out of the deal. In this case, much to the benefit of a very large, very profitable corporation. So my question to you is, will you exercise extreme care and will you make sure that if, when you are considering such national transmission corridors, you are protecting the rights of local farmers and local ranchers and local citizens who can't afford to hire lobbyists, who don't own these corporations, who are not getting money out of the deal, but whose livelihoods are tied to the land? We'll start with you, Missy. Uh, yes, Senator, Section 216 is, is an important part of the law. It's no less a responsibility of FERC than any other part of the Federal Power Act. I would take the same care towards faithfully uh, adhering and applying that law based on the particular facts before me. Of course, I am aware that the Commission is in, in the midst of rulemaking on this issue, so I would not want to prejudge any particular issues that may come out of that. But when it comes to any um, issues that may come before me, if I were honored to be confirmed, I'd be looking very closely at the criteria that, that you and the other members of Congress have put into law and taking into account all of those critically important issues. These are areas that affect many people, many stakeholders, and I think it's critical in these matters, as in the others in the Commission's jurisdiction, to look at all of those incredibly closely and to apply the law that Congress has put in place. Okay. Okay, good. So you're not going to allow you're not going to allow the corporate interest to, to trump what local farmers and local ranchers need because what will happen is you and I both know what will happen is in these in these cases you'll have the people who stand to make lots of money on it in this case it's corporation and energy and they'll be telling you how desperately important this is and what who you will not hear from are the multi generation farmers who live on the land so what what I want from you is a commitment to remember the people who are actually affected here I know the corporations will be well represented. I mean, they'll be very, they're probably in this room. But who won't be, unless you take it into account, are local farmers, local producers, local folks. What about you, Mr. Rosner? Thanks for the question, Senator, and yes, I, I commit. Good, that was easy. Ms. Chang. I have great respect for states uh, and local farmers or local peoples, uh, and I also commend that the current FERC has an Office of Public Participation, and I fully support to make sure that we have, we hear the voices that traditionally have not been brought into these cases. So I will also commit to make sure that I look at this type of issue 
carefully. Great. Thank you. Very good. Um, my time's expired. I've, I've, I have a few more questions uh, for each of you. And Ms. Chang, I want to ask you in particular, I, I think in the past you've been an opponent of tariffs on solar panels made in China. I'm hoping your view on that has changed, especially in light of the slave labor we now know that China uses for so many of its of its so-called energy projects. I'm thinking of the Uyghurs in particular. But I, I have other people are here who want to ask questions. So I will give you those for the record and look forward to your responses. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the chairman, Senator Hirono. Thank you. In addressing the fitness to serve of uh, nominees who come before any of the committees on which I sit, I ask the following two initial questions, and I'll just go down the line, starting with Ms. Chang. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No. 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 Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement relating to this kind of conduct? No. 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 For Ms. Chang, Hawaii is transitioning from heavy reliance on imported petroleum to 100% renewable power and an economy with net zero carbon pollution by 12, 2045. Your service as the Massachusetts Undersecretary of Energy and Climate Solutions gave you the responsibility of helping the state manage its energy transition goals while ensuring affordable and reliable energy for the people of your state. How would you apply the lessons you learned to your work as a FERC commissioner? Thank you very much, Senator, for that question. Uh, I have learned a tremendous amount in my time as uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, I have learned about various different types of resources as well as demand side reduction, if we can, um, across, across various different resources. So I do believe in making sure reliability is number one, because as I said earlier, without reliability, we can't even transition and no one in this country will tolerate any outages. So I think I understand the complexity of the energy systems uh, through my work in Massachusetts, and I, um, I will definitely carry that with me going forward. Thank you, Senator. For Ms. C. Uh, Ms. C, I am recognize the uh, importance of the Chevron Doctrine. I know you're familiar with that doctrine, which recognizes that Congress delegates authority to technical experts in federal agencies selected by Congress to implement federal law in line with our congressional intent. And under the Chevron Doctrine, courts give deference to agency interpretation of federal law. You represented the state of West Virginia in its case against the EPA, arguing to strictly limit agency authority. In its 2022 decision in that case, the Supreme Court used the major questions doctrine to basically undermine the Chevron doctrine. And I, I have a feeling it won't be long before the Supreme Court just totally eliminates the Chevron doctrine altogether. And of course, you are, um, you know, you, you are certainly entitled to represent the state of West Virginia in its positions, but I am curious about your views on agency authority, given that uh, you've been nominated to lead a critical federal commission. How precise do you think Congress needs to be in delegating authority to agencies? For example, do you think FERC has the authority to consider the carbon pollution imp impacts of energy infrastructure, despite that not being explicitly mentioned in its authorizing statute. Thank you, Senator. And you referenced my work in my current position as an advocate for the state of West Virginia and others. And as you noted, that is position um, that is work I have done as a lawyer, and I take mm -hmm. seriously those ethical duties of zealous representation. Um, I, I certainly understand that if confirmed, this would be a different role uh, of we're acting impartially. And I think that that would be important when it comes to the role of the agencies. As I have said, my, my philosophy would be to follow the law, and I would be looking in these areas to see what exactly has Congress delegated and tasked FERC with doing. I'd be looking for that best interpretation consistent with governing precedent. Well, based on your uh, the arguments that you made in that case, and the fact that basically the Supreme Court uh, held 
for Massachusetts and apply this major question of doctrines, which requires Congress to be very precise in its language and its delegation of authority to agencies to implement the laws that we enact. That is a tall order because uh, Congress, uh, it's pretty much of a challenge for Congress to, to deal with whatever contingencies may arise. And that is why there is this doctrine called the Chevron Doctrine and Delegation of Authority. So my question was, are you going to pretty much, should you be confirmed, pretty much be limit your uh, work on FERC to the precise language that is in the law that applies to FERC? And if there is no language to that says FERC should consider the carbon pollution impacts of its decision making that you would not consider such impacts. Senator, my understanding is that FERC, like any other agency, only has the authority that Congress has delegated to it. So I think that the statute is where that authority begins and ends. I would be looking at the language, but also at the other tools of interpretation of the context and purpose that Congress has put into place in laying out the scope of agency authority. So in other words, <laughs> You know, I don't want to get into a major argument with you, but, uh, but we know that the elimination of the Chevron Doctrine would be a major change to, to agencies in implementing the laws that Congress passes, and also that it would require Congress to be very precise. If Congress, for example, prevented people from getting, uh, tried to, to uh, prevent people from falling through round holes, but somebody fell through a, a, a square hole, then they're under the statute, that person would not be protected. So, you know, I'm not making this up. Believe me, one of the justices on the Supreme Court uh, made that very clear in how he would interpret uh, federal law and agencies' interpretation. So what you're saying to me really is that you would very much uh, want to look at the precise language of the law, and I think we need to be very <laughs> aware of that. Thank you, Mr. Senator from Montana on behalf of the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Um, I want to congratulate all the nominees and to thank you for your service. Going through this confirmation process is not easy. It's not fun. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask a number of questions to all three of you. I'd like to keep your answers, if you could, short and precise. Uh, behind me is the mission statement of FERC, which is both on the website and was republished as recently as February of 2024. It states that FERC's mission is to, and I'm quoting, assist consumers in obtaining reliable, safe, secure, and economically efficient energy. FERC is not a climate regulator. FERC is not President Biden's Climate Commission. FERC is an independent body that focuses on safety and economics, period. My question, and yes or no, do you agree that FERC is an economic and safety regulator and not a climate regulator? We'll start with Ms. Chang. Yes. Mr. Rosner? Yes, sir. Ms. C? Yes. Former Chairman Glick pushed forward controversial proposals that refocused pipeline approvals away from consumers and toward climate regulators and climate regulations, far outside of FERC's statutory jurisdiction. Current Chairman Phillips, after hearing from bipartisan members on this committee, has rightfully kept those proposals sidelined. So another yes or no, do you agree that Chairman Glick's proposals were outside of FERC's jurisdiction? And do you support the commission's decision to pull those back? Ms. Chang. I understand the tension. I have not reviewed everything in that policy statement, in those policy statements. And if I were fortunate, fortunate enough to be confirmed, I will dedicate my time to better understand the issues at hand. Is that a yes or a no? That's a yes that I will commit to understanding the issues. And uh, I definitely support the current commission's decision, but 
again. But you I might bring back the prior commission director. No, I'm sorry, the current chairs. Current chairs, okay. Current chairs uh, yeah. approach. Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the question, Senator. And um, I, I, I do agree with uh, Chairman Phillips' approach. And if honored to be confirmed, my focus at the commission would be ensuring that we have predictable, transparent, durable, and fair policies that are grounded uh, in the statute and court precedent. And the, and the reason this question is important, because it literally was a shift in direction from where Chairman Phillips was and where Chairman Click was. I mean, a clear change in philosophy and direction. So, um, Ms. C. Yes, Senator, I recognize that um, dramatic shift in direction. I, I think it is important to follow all of the laws that apply to the commission. There are some environmental duties that Congress has given in NEPA, but I, I think you are absolutely correct when it comes to the primary purpose in the Federal Power Act and the National Gas Act. I think it is very important that FERC takes its role seriously as an economic regulator and follows all aspects of the law that apply to it. I'm going to move to LNG. Uh, President Biden recently weaponized the Department of Energy to pause approvals for LNG exports, which actually overall reduce carbon, putting our allies and our own economic and energy security at risk. FERC also plays an important role in LNG export terminal approvals, but unlike DOE, you are an independent agency. Here's my question, will you commit to review all LNG export terminal approvals solely through FERC's statutorily defined economic considerations and not through President Biden's climate agenda. And to be fair to Ms. Chang, I'll start from this direction and go this way. So you have to be the lead off hitter, uh, Ms. C. Uh, yes, Senator. I think it's very important that FERC has an independent role here. I would be looking to FERC's separate statutory authorities, which are distinct from the Department of Energy's authorities, and I would to commit to the timely review of any applications that come before FERC if I were honored to be confirmed. Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the question, Senator, and um, yes, I, 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 FERC uh, has uh, its own statute and its own responsibilities under that statute, and I commit, if honored to be confirmed, to following that statute, following court precedent, and making decisions in a timely manner. Thank you. Ms. Chang? I agree. Okay, thank you. My last question, and then I see Senator Hoban has, uh, has arrived, so I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. Senator Cantwell and I have introduced the largest bipartisan hydropower permitting reform bill in 20 years. Current relicensing timelines take nearly a decade and cost millions of dollars for this reliable, low-cost, zero-carbon source of power. Yes or no, do you agree that we need to speed up the permitting timelines for hydropower licensing and relicensing in order to continue to grow our hydropower portfolio? Ms. Chang. Thank you for your question, Senator. I always support streamlining and being more efficient in our processing of um, licenses and applications. So I will dedicate my time, if I had the fortune to be confirmed, to look into this question because I need to actually understand what the constraints might be before understanding how much streamlining that could be, could be conducted. Thank you. Mr. Rosner. Thank you for the question, Senator, and I, I commend you for the impressive uh, bipartisan uh, effort that that, uh, that has emerged under your leadership. Uh, timely review of hydropower licenses and relicensing uh, is a priority for me. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. C. And Senator, I certainly agree with the importance that hydropower has. Um, I, I think that efficiency and, and thorough review is very important. I also understand the different responsibility that FERC has when it comes to these licenses. That includes a number of factors. They may not be present in other contexts, um, particularly safety factors, which can be critically important in this area. So certainly I commit to the importance of timely review, understanding the thoroughness of the task that Congress has given to FERC in this area. Thank you. As the acting ranking member who's been delegated from the acting chairman will now delegate both the chairmanship and active ranking member responsibilities solely <laughs> to Senator Hoven to not only ask your questions, but to run the rest of the hearing. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Acting Chairman. And now as the Acting Chairman, I think there's all kinds of things that we need to conduct today as far as... If, 
Been, I, I'm here for unanimous consent. So, yeah. I'm hoping this, if you want to. So, this, all right. this could go for a while, and we may have a few votes. We'll see. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, being here. We appreciate it very much. Uh, I want to talk about base load, you know, that power that's available uh, 365 days a year. Uh, and, uh, you know, on the coldest day and on the hottest day, and in spite of whatever, other, whatever kind of weather we have, and so on and so forth. So, to have base load, that means we're going to need to have things like coal. And uh, in states like mine, we're doing some amazing things with uh, carbon capture. We've addressed SOX, NOx, mercury, and now we're going to crack the code on CO2 capture, too. We already have a coal gasification plant that both captures CO2 for enhanced oil recovery and it captures CO2 for geologic storage. The EOR is about 50% of the, of the CO2 stream. The uh, geologic storage is another 35%. That takes it up to about 85% and they're working up from there, okay? We have a, a cooperatively owned uh, traditional coal-fired plant that's uh, uh, got a program called Project Tundra, where they're working very closely with Department of Energy and others, and they uh, are uh, moving forward with capturing CO2 on a traditional coal-fired plant. And we also have an investor-owned plant uh, at uh, Coal Creek that's seeking to do the same thing using the 45Q tax credit, which we work to get in place, okay? So I emphasize we've had to deal with various emissions issues in the past. Sox, Knox, Mercury, and others, okay? And now they're working to capture CO2 and both use it for other energy as well as geologic storage. But this is something that needs to be done, you know, on a broad basis so that it's commercially viable, you know, with the kind of programs that, that get us to that point. And uh, so my question to you is, given all that, uh, do you, uh, are you willing to support making sure that we get energy from all sources, including coal, with these latest, greatest technologies that we are not only developing, but deploying? And I'd like a response from each of you, starting with you, Ms. Chang. Yes, thank you, Senator. And I am uh, fortunate to know a little bit about the coal facilities as well as the projects to capture carbon emissions and store them in North Dakota and your state it has the geology to actually mm -hmm. do that. So I'm super excited for really the United States to lead in this technology and use the uh, tax credit that's, you, that's, uh, that's made available through the various different legislation to make this happen. And so I do see that as a potential future um, and a bright future for for our ability to capture emissions while still using our existing fuel resources in this country. Thank you. You set a very high bar with that answer, so I don't know, uh, Mr. Rosner, or we'll see if you want to follow or not, but that was a pretty good answer. Well, well I'll try. Uh, well, right. Thank you for the question, Senator, and, and, and I admire your, your leadership on, on, on carbon capture uh, technology. Um, what, what I will say is this, is that um, the, the past decade of, um, of grid challenges has shown us that there's strength and diversity um, uh, of fuel mix, and uh, that I, I recognize that and understand that, and if honored to be confirmed, that will be something that I pay close attention to. Thank you. And at the risk of ruining a good thing, uh, I, I certainly agree. I think one of the things that I have had the opportunity to, to think through in my current role as a state lawyer and working with a number of other states, including your state, is seeing the different resources and innovation and opportunities that states have when it comes to contributing to our power grids. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And I think certainly when you talk about the concern about uh, baseload power, that's a concern that I take seriously. And that wouldn't be one that's just coming from me. I, I look at the warnings that we are receiving from um, the electric reliability um, regulators from NERC and from some of the organized power grids who talk about the importance of this issue too. Certainly FERC's role is to be fuel source neutral and to support the uh, choices and policy uh, preferences of the states who get to make these important generation decisions, but I think it is important to look at all of those sources, including the important ones you're talking about the innovation we're seeing. Which leads right into my second question when you talk about being fuel source neutral. Mm -hmm. Uh, some people call it using all of the above energy policies, but some people talk about it, but they don't really advocate for it. They really want to put up barriers in a lot of different ways. So 
for example, for regional grid operators, if they come in and they decide we only want one kind of energy and we're going to skew pricing and regulatory approvals and those kind of things in our, you know, in our system, what's FERC's role in making sure, well, wait a minute, not only do the, you need 24-7 baseload, you know, throughout your region, but you affect the other areas as well. And if you're putting externalities on power providers that are bringing power, you know, into your uh, regional grid system, that can affect the ability to have all sources of energy out there making sure we have this baseload and undermine the stability of the grid. Seems like this is a really important thing for you all to be on top of and, and make sure that we have, that we don't have those kind of problems put up, you know, with a patchwork around the country, right? What do you do about that? How do you make sure that's addressed, starting with Ms. Chang? Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, if I understand your question correctly, I, I do think, one, FERC is a technology neutral regulator, economic regulator. And my understanding is the system operators and the re regional transmission organizations are also technology neutral. So to the extent what? that... To the extent that the market design is somehow, as you say, skewed, I think FERC does have a role to make sure that market design and the, and the processes of processing projects, uh, such as transmission projects, uh, and interconnecting through the transmission, pro uh, transmission infrastructure is also technology neutral. How do you do that? If, if the system operators are skewing the playing field, how do you do that? I think one is to investigate first what kind of um, biases, as you s have suggested, exist. And um, my close uh, uh, workings with RTOs and ISOs is that they tend to be they tend to be technology neutral in their way of thinking. So it it will be very interesting, and I definitely would be interested in devoting some time to understand your concern. I'm, be happy to work with you and your staff to better understand that topic. I would appreciate that. Uh, same question, Mr. Rosner and Ms. C. Well, well thank you, Senator. And, and um, I, I, I think um, the American public uh, and, and uh, is best served by a regulator that um, embraces um, the durability of a fuel-neutral approach um, to its decision-making. Um, I, I think um, the, the grid uh, works best when we allow the grid uh, resources to provide all of the services that they're technically capable of providing, regardless of what fuel is powering them. But if they skew the playing field, does FERC have a role? Uh, I think, yes, absolutely. I, I think um, FERC's responsibility is to make sure that um, we're providing reliable, affordable energy at reasonable price. and. Uh, um, if, if the role is skewed, then I, I would wonder whether we're actually realizing those goals. Ms. C. And, and Senator, I agree that I think FERC certainly does have a role. I, I think one, one area that we haven't talked about as much is when it comes to its, its authority for just and reasonable rates. And part of that is making sure that we have the right market incentives to make sure that we have the um, innovation that we need, um, but also that we are re respecting and, and properly valuing the generators that we currently have. I, I think having an accurately functioning market that is sending those right uh, price signals is an important piece of FERC's jurisdiction in this question. Okay, one, I know I'm going a little bit over here, but last question is, look, everyone talks about permitting reform. You hear it all the time. The challenge with permitting reform, it always gets complicated and turns into some of the same problems we have now where, you know, the rules, regulations, law, and everything else gets interpreted so many ways, and you end up with the same kind of maze that people can't figure their way through, and so you don't really have the streamlining that you're trying to get with regulatory reform. One of the things that we did last year was try to say, okay, and, and put it in legis legislation, but already it's getting, I think, uh, changed. And that is, for an EA, it needs to be done in one year, or the project's need to be improved, approved, and for an EIS, it's got to be completed in two years, or the project is deemed approved, so that we don't go, you know, with these five, seven-year processes, and then end up in litigation to boot. What's your reaction to this approach of, we're going to have to simplify it or we're not going to get any streamlining. Into I, thank you, Senator. I am always in favor of streamlining processes. Um, however, I also understand that some processes are, 
are complicated or can be complex. So I have not studied exactly what the constraints are in these processes for permitting. So I generally support streamlining permitting. Mr. Rosner. Thank you, Senator. T timely review of infrastructure is essential. It's essential to achieving our um, economic uh, prosperity in the country uh, and capturing all the economic opportunity on the horizon. Uh, if honored to be confirmed, uh, timely review of infrastructure would be a priority for me. Good. And I agree. I certainly appreciate Congress's leadership when it comes to more clarity in this area and, and giving particular timeframes. I think that's something that is important to carry out. My understanding is FERC had already been doing that in a large respect, and I know that it is committed to doing the same from conversations I've had. I look forward to looking into that issue. Um, but I think that this is an area where predictability and certainty matters, and I appreciate the leadership Congress has shown of putting more of those standards into the law. But you'd agree that we need to do more. I do agree that efficient permitting is very important. I think it's important to look at all the factors that, that you and Congress have told FERC to look at. It's important to be thorough in that responsibility, but I do think that all of the stakeholders um, are entitled to have, um, the, uh, to have their government work quickly as they are moving through those um, requirements and procedures. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thanks to all three of you. I uh, appreciate you being here and uh, um, look forward to working with you. Um, we appreciate you being here, your responsiveness to our questions and concerns, your willingness to take on, uh, obviously, these very important tasks. Members will have until 6 p.m. tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record. And uh, I'd like to conduct a little more business, but probably best if I don't. So we're adjourned. Thanks so much. <laughs>